let's uh, let's start with thinking about um, this. I want to tell you a few things about um, this this book, the genealogy of morals and Nietzsche, and this might makes right theory to try to draw a few things together before we look at the nuts and bolts of it. So. When you hear Nietzsche in today's culture, he's usually associated with this notion that you know the, the strong um, impose their their values, their will on the weak, and if the weak don't like it, then they can rise up and, and show themselves to be strong. Otherwise, they're disgusting, weak, cowardly. They deserve what they're getting. Only the strong actually uh, deserve to be valued, paid attention to, that sort of thing. And that is very similar to this might makes right theory that, that Thrasymachus was expressing. And you see people saying stuff like this throughout all of history. Um, I, I imagine you could probably think of some other people uh, in the course of time who've said things like that, right? Um, the strong, they get what they get, and, and that's their right because they're the strong. Uh, if the weak don't want to stand up and defend themselves, screw the weak. That's the might makes right theory in a nutshell. Um, can you think of any, you know, fictional characters that, that exemplify that, that sort of thing? We, we have a lot of these in movies, don't we? They actually say things like that. Some of them, some of the bad guys in movies just um, do their thing and they don't try to justify what they're doing. But if you're, if you're expressing the might makes right philosophy, you're actually sort of explaining a little bit of what you're doing. And usually in movies, these are the villains, aren't they? The might makes right mentality people. So who would be some examples of that in movies that you could think of? Yeah. Uh, Ursula from the little mermaid, where she feels like the powerful who rule the human race is inferior. Okay. And she wants power, so that way she can make everything by the ocean. And oh, that's so interesting. I, I've got to say, I've never heard anyone bring up the Little Mermaid in, in, in this respect. But that's a, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's aft. It works. I was thinking more like you know some space movie or you know some, some adventure movie or something like that. But yeah, that works. What are, what are some other movies where you got a, a fairly Nietzschean kind of villain? People actually say things like, uh, you know, better if I rule because I actually have the the guts to do what needs to get done. You know, I, I, I stand for force. I stand for power. Anything come to mind? I know you guys watch a lot of movies. Everyone watches a lot of movies. Yeah. Another Disney one, uh, Aladdin with Jafar. And okay. To yeah. Is, is Jafar um, just about, you know, getting his hands on things, is he just greedy or does he want power too? He actually he wants power. He wants power, yeah. Darth Vader? Yeah, you know, Darth Vader's an interesting one because he has like that moral conversion <coughs> at the end, right? He's kind of a conflicted character. Um, definitely his boss would be an example of that. Uh, and how does his boss get into things? Hey, he sees a lot of disorder and he says, yeah, somebody strong has got to come in here and take charge, but then he gets corrupted, right? Um, yeah, so you, you get the idea. You get the general idea. Um, now, Nietzsche is not presenting it that way. Nietzsche actually thinks this is a, a good thing. And so, in presenting it, I'm going to actually try to sort of take the side of Nietzsche as much as possible so you can at least sort of try it on imaginatively and see whether you think this would, it would work. It would work better than Thrasymachus. Thrasymachus probably didn't convince you that well. Nietzsche might be a little bit more convincing. He starts out talking about um, several different kinds of morality. And this, this uh, book, by the way, is divided up into three essays. And each essay treats a different set of issues. I've cut a lot of it out because there's a lot of digressions and a lot of extra material. Um, we're not actually going to talk, I think, too much today about the priest, who's an important figure in this. But I, I want to keep it as sort of a, just a two-perspective view. And Nietzsche would say, when it comes to morality, there is no such thing as morality per se. There are just moralities. And you pick one or you pick the other. Or you make your own. 
But if you make your own, you're probably going to actually turn out to be doing one or, or the other. And he thinks that historically, the original valuation, the original morality, took place between the values of good and not evil, but what's the other contrary to, to good? Bad, right. And he wants to make a distinction between bad and evil. He thinks that the fundamental understanding of good changes depending on whether you're, you're opposing it to, to bad or to evil. And so here's the way that he sketches out it, it, it playing itself out in the beginning. In the beginning, you have, in every society, you have some people who are stronger than others. They become the nobility because they're strong, because they're able to appropriate from, from other people. They're the ones who are powerful, and they impose their wills on other people. So that, that's a, a distinction of power right there. How do we get to morality? How do we get to good and bad in that? Well, these are the people who actually define themselves as good. And why do they do that? Because they can. Because nobody else keeps them from doing that. If anybody wanted to keep them from defining themselves as good, they could rise up and, and you know, defeat them or something like that. But they don't. And they also impose onto the common people, the, the weak, the, the people who are less healthy, the people who are, uh, in their view, cowardly, less given to, to you know, exerting themselves, imposing themselves, imposing their own wills. They give them the valuation of bad. And Nietzsche has a lot of like Greek terms in there, and we don't have to actually worry about those too much. I actually cut out a lot of etymological material where he talks about how this is also played out in Latin and in you know, ancient uh, you know, Celtic languages and stuff like that. We don't have to worry about that. The basic point is that you see this over and over again in um, primitive societies, at least the records that we have of them. Somebody setting themselves up as the powerful, uh, proclaiming themselves as the good, and imposing upon other people that they are the bad. And the, and the bad people suck it up. And they, they go along with it. If they didn't want to, Nietzsche would say, well, they would rise up and they would actually become you know, rivals to these people. And that's sometimes what you see happening. I mean, if you look at ancient history, um, going you know, way, way back before Greece and Rome, um, you look at ancient, uh, uh, not Sumeria, but um, Mesopotamia, you actually see people coming in from the outside, um, being born in quite low circumstances, and rising to become the king of the city, like Sargon did. Um, you know, a story about being born, in, you know, born and then being put in a basket and floating down the river and being found by, by somebody that we hear with Moses, which is an interesting story. It turns out also to have been the story for, for Sargon. Um, pretty humble beginnings. And he's able to sort of rise. Uh, why? Because he chooses to. Because he exerts himself. Because he makes other people into the tools of his will. Um, so, you know, this isn't necessarily a... a nobility where you're born into it and then you stick with it. As a matter of fact, if you're born into this nobility and you don't prove yourself, you might fall from it into the, the ranks of the common. You know, you might be seen as, as a, uh, a uh, coward, right? And in, in you know, ancient societies that, that really stressed warlike virtues, being a coward was like being nobody. Uh, it was like being lower than so, he calls this the pathos of distance. Pathos actually means feeling. It's a Greek word. Uh, it means feeling or emotion. There's this feeling, this sense of distance. And the good are able to value themselves. And this has nothing to do, like he says at the beginning, this has nothing to do with notions of like egoistic versus unegoistic or altruistic. Um, this only has to do with notions of getting to decide for yourself what counts as good and then imposing that valuation onto to other people. So he, um, he says, you know, when do we start worrying about egoistic and unegoistic? When something else happens, what he calls the slave revolt in, in morality. He says, um, 
The collapse of aristocratic value judgments is when this entire contrast between egoistic, selfish, right, and unegoistic, unselfish, disinterested, good for other people, pressed itself uh, strongly into human awareness. It says that's the instinct of the herd, which through this contrast finally gets its word. Um, and eventually the, the masses, they impose a new kind of valuation, which we're going to look at in a minute, and they become the new master. But they don't, they don't become master in the same way that these kind of individuals do, who just sort of rise up and uh, exert themselves and impose themselves. Um, I, want to, I want to dwell on this a little bit more. He says a few other things about this. Um, he says, these people name themselves after a typical characteristic. And if you actually read ancient Greek literature, ancient Latin literature, and I'm going to sort of take it on, on Nietzsche's word that if you read ancient Iranian literature, because I can't read that stuff, um, you know, or, or, well, if you read ancient German literature too, you know, like the Nibelungen Lied or things like that, you see this taking place. They named themselves the truthful. They call themselves the esthlos in Greek. Um, uh, he says, a man who is, who possesses morality, who really exists, who is true. And so this, this is sort of turning political superiority, the capacity to rule other people, into what he calls spiritual superiority. Superiority in terms of higher values. And I'm going to skip over the discussion about the, the priest and just hit on a few other points. He says, this knightly aristocratic judgments of value have as their basic assumption a powerful physicality, a blooming, rich, even overflowing health, together with those things required to maintain these qualities, what, what do you need in order to maintain that in like the ancient world before we had, you know, planet fitness and things like that down the road. Um, war, adventure, hunting, dancing, war games, and in general everything which involves strong, free, happy action. So, you know, the nobility are able to engage in these things that are typically human, um, that are things that some people actually do on vacation these days, right? People go off on hunting trips. We have to like make time for that, don't we? Um, adventure. Well, you can. You don't have to go out on a trip to adventure. Just you know, go out on a Saturday night, I suppose. Um, war games. Everything that involves strong, free, happy action. So, so these are people who don't have an awful lot on their minds. Are these are these people who are punching a time clock, worrying about getting to work on time, or about you know getting the assignment done for for the next. Uh, class in ethics or anything like that? I don't think so. These, these are people who are, you know, really enjoying life and, and they're doing that because they're, they're tough. They're strong. They're powerful because they actually are willing to, you know, do whatever it takes to be powerful. And the people that they've imposed this on, maybe some of them, you know, uh, could rise and, and, you know, fit in there. And if they do, more power to them. That's fine. But for the most part, these are the people who are punching the clocks, who are farming the fields, who are preoccupied with these sorts of cares, who, when they get into a fight, are the ones who back down, who are unwilling to sort of throw themselves in. Um, there's one other thing I want to hit on, too, before I talk about the slave revolt. He says, the well-born felt that they were the happy ones. They didn't construct their happiness by looking at their, their, their enemies or talking themselves into being happy, they associated happiness with action, with activity, with doing something, with actually being out there in the world and making things happen. Um, now, generally what that means is making things happen to other people. So that's where this, you know, imposition part comes in. It's not just like working on themselves. If, if these guys were getting into competitions, they would have to be the ones winning the competitions, and they would feel like you know they're on top in part because all these other people are lower than them, right? But they also take joy just in the competing. So I think that, you know there's a, there's a certain part of us that can relate to this, isn't there? Even if you know <coughs> we're not these people necessarily, there's a part of us that can relate to this. There's a part of us that actually, when we see people like this, kind of likes to, to watch that, identifies with them perhaps, or dreams about being like them. Um, now let's look at the other valuation. He calls this the 
the slave revolt in morality. And, you know, he also talks about the herd. You get the idea that for Nietzsche, being a common person is not a good thing, right? Um, being somebody who fits in, not a good thing. And he, he was a you know, pretty good example that he wasn't a person who fit in very well. Um, he also was not the, you know, Superman that he describes here. He actually was fairly unhealthy, suffered from migraines, you know, had to go up to Switzerland and spend a lot of time laying in bed to, to be able to do the writing that he did. But, you know, that's not all of us measure up to our own ideas. So he talks about this, um, this uh, slave revolt in the he says, slave revolt and morality begins when what he calls resentment, we're going to look at that word in a moment, becomes creative and gives birth to values. The resentment of those beings were prevented from a genuine reaction. But these people down here, do you think they like the strong imposing stuff on them? They say, oh, this is really nice. I can't imagine a better life. How do you like it when people force you down and make you do things? What does that feel like for you? Let's sort of... Put that on the table. Intimidating. Okay, intimidating. What else? What else do you feel? Let's say I said pop quiz right now. You know, how would you feel? Panic, perhaps, right? How else? So, be honest. Yes. Yeah, you'd be ticked off, right? What the hell is this? This isn't the way the the game's supposed to be played. I'm already doing stuff that I didn't want to do, like get up and you know go to an eight o'clock class, and uh, you know I did the reading and and um, you know looked through this stuff on iLearn and I you know I'm up to date with the homework and what what the hell, right? That's that's the reaction that a lot of people would have. It's an understandable reaction. Nietzsche you know thinks that that's that's perfectly normal. What happens if you try to resist those who actually are powerful though? What's your experience of that? How, how many of you have, like, um, at one time or another, you know, gotten yourself into a, a fight with the administration or your boss or, or something like that? Very few of you? I, I'm, I'm surprised. I'm, I'm willing to bet that maybe your parents, if your parents are domineering. Uh, what's it like, though? What happens, typically? Yeah. They're, gonna, they're not just going to, like, lay down. They're going to push back. Yeah, they don't say, oh, I see the... I see the, 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 the reasonableness of your, your complaint. I can't believe I, I imposed this thing upon you that was so unfair. Let me fix that for you. Is that how powerful people talk? Not usually. They don't stay powerful long if they do. They, they, what do they do? They crack down on you, right? I'm going to make you regret having crossed me. Isn't that more often what happens? I remember a teacher when I was in uh, middle school. He was wrong, and I was actually right. I had to do something in the, like civics class, and I, I was kind of a smart, you know, smart aleck in class. And uh, so I pointed this out. And he was a teacher, and I was a student, right? And so this is very, you know, back then it was very, very hierarchical. And um, I insisted on the fact that I was actually right. Well, he gave me detention, and you know. My mom came, and you know she was she was. I, was, I figured she'd take my side because, after all, I was right, and this is it's wrong to impose detention on somebody if they don't deserve it, isn't it? Uh, well, she actually took his side. She said, "Look, he's the teacher; he gets to do whatever he wants. You better shut up next time." So now, think about all these sorts of experiences. I think you've probably had lots of experiences like this. You know. Your boss comes down on you for something. You can't say what you'd like to do your boss, right? What happens to that feeling inside of you? Does it go away? Just, you know, just take a couple, ten deep breaths. Think, you know, serenity now or something like that. Like, you know. Does that really work? Again, what's your experience on that? What do we do, typically, to the way? Get our angry feelings out. Yeah. Invent the friends. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you very you can't say that to the boss, right? So you, you you say something to your friends and family. That person's such a jerk. Can't believe they do that. They're, you know, this isn't the first time that they've been like that. And then um, 
After a while, your friends and family will probably get sick of it and say, well, you know, go stand up to them or something along those lines. But until then, you do that. And that's, for Nietzsche, that's what the common people tend to do. They don't actually, like, rise up and, and you know, oppose force openly with their own force. They kind of, you know, talk, talk behind people's backs and, and tear them down and um, try to make themselves feel okay about that. When really the reality is they're, they're stuck in this bottom position. So the, the slave revolt in morality takes place with what he calls a transvaluation of values. Things being turned topsy-turvy. So the noble good person... Oh, I don't want the good. Noble, powerful... And I'm actually going to put a term here that he doesn't use. Mean, selfish person gets put on the bottom. And they are, they're not good, and they're not bad, and they're not ugly, like the movie. <coughs> what are they? What's the other value that's possible? Well, it's not, it's not neutral in this case. Evil. Evil, right. They get defined as evil by the common herd weak person who then gets to define themselves by contrast as good and the um, the difference here is, is it should be you know market to you the noble person is imposed is deciding that I'm good and they impose this other category on the, on the other people. And if the other people don't like it, they can actually, you know, make their own categories, or they can rise up, or they can they can fight, whatever. Um, the common hurt people, they don't start by defining themselves as good and then defining the noble people as as evil. They first define the noble people as evil. It's a sort of reaction against them, and then only after doing that do they define themselves as good. And what does good mean? Not evil. There's no real positive content to it. So, you know, what's an example of an evil thing that the evil people do? Again, let's think of movie villains. Darth Vader. They had him before, right? What makes Darth Vader evil? Other than wearing a black... <laughs> That's how we know he's a bad guy, right? Because he wears a, a black uh, helmet and stuff like that. He's got that menacing voice, right? Think about the very first Star Wars movie. How could you tell that this guy was a bad guy in like the first five minutes? Yeah. He chokes the guy? Yeah. I think they call that force choking. <laughs> force chokes the guy. And it does it in movie after movie, right? There's actually an interesting piece uh, I read recently, I think it was on Cracked, where it was saying Darth Vader's a terrible leader because his, his solution to, you know, people failing, force choke them. That doesn't motivate people to do better, does it? Um, but he does fit the type, right? So force choking people, uh, losing control of your temper, that's evil, right? So what's good? Not losing control of your temper. Forgiving people when they do the wrong thing. Taking them aside and giving them another chance, and counseling them, all that sort of stuff. But in Nietzsche's view, there's real no positive content there. You're just not doing what the bad people, what the evil people do. Um, and you get to make yourself feel good by contrasting yourself, then, to the evil people. Man, I wouldn't be like that boss. If, I, if somebody gave me power, I would treat all my employees really well. I would care about what they think. And I wouldn't, you know, mess around with their schedules and what are other things people complain about. Take out my frustrations on them. Um, I'd give them raises and all that, that, that sort of stuff. People say that sort of stuff because they're imagining themselves actually having power and being like in the position of the powerful and then just not being evil. Uh, it's kind of funny because, you know, there's a major company that has as one of its like ethics statements, don't be evil. Anyone know which one that is? Offhand? Google. How far is that going to get you as a guide to life? Don't be evil. How far do you think? Will that carry you through all your moral dilemmas that you're likely to face? Would that have helped you out? I, a lot of you have faced moral 
and a lot of ones, you know, particularly prickly ones before, would that have helped you out? Somebody just coming along, don't be evil. Doesn't tell you much, does it? Um, no, they, they do form some ideals that, that fit this. The other thing that he talks about in here is this process called Rizantimov. Rizant. <coughs> there we go. And if you want a sort of thumbnail sketch of what Rizantimov is, that's what he happens when things happen to you that you don't like and you're powerless to do anything about it, and it just kind of gnaws at you and stays in you and sours within you and becomes part of who you are and changes your, your character. Um, he talks about this, well, I'll, I'll read you a passage where he talks about this. He says, um, The, no, uh, all noble, noble morality grows out of the triumphant affirmation of one's own self. Right? Slave morality from the start says no to what is outside, other to a not itself. And this no is a creative act. This transformation of the glance which confers value, this is inherent in Rizantimov. So that tells us what's going on. What, what is Rizantimov then? Um, he says... Being unable, to take, uh, being unable to actually take revenge on one's enemies, that's part of it. Um, he talks about Rizantamon having poisonous eyes. Um, it's only really much later that he gives you a good characterization of it. So I'll, I'll read this section from uh, the third essay. He says, uh, every suffering person instinctively seeks a cause for their suffering. So, yeah, think when you were a kid, right? You stub your toe. Um, is it your fault that you stubbed your toe when you were a little kid? Whose fault is it? Mom's. It could be your mom's, yeah. The thing like, you stubbed your toe on. Thing is, yeah, you, like you kick it again, and that, it turns out to be really dumb because, you know, you, you stub your toe on it first. I used to go, like, kick a tractor when it didn't work when I was a kid. That was that dumb. You know, I'd get, I'd get mad. Things made out of metal. Uh, yeah, or we seek around for other people. You know, kids will actually, one kid will go up and like punch another kid, and then the teacher will come by and say, what's wrong with you? Why did you hit, you know, little Susie over there? And what, what is the kid going to say? She made me do it. It's her fault. This is very common among kids. Every suffering person instinctively seeks a cause for his or her suffering, or more, more precisely, an agent or more precisely, a guilty agent, sensitive to suffering. Somebody who we can take revenge on, on one pretext or another, we can unload our feelings either in fact, or he says, in effigy. What's, what's an effigy? Do you guys know that word? We have an effigy of some, somebody? Are you talking about burning somebody in effigy? What does that mean? Yeah. Maybe like a likeness of someone? Yeah, so like if you want to burn, you know, um, well, we don't, Uncle Sam doesn't exist, right? But somebody wants to burn Uncle Sam to show, you know, they don't like America. They make an Uncle Sam out of paper machine and they burn it. That's what burning an effigy is. So, you know, you can do that with your boss. You can actually make a little model of your boss and then throw it in the fire, and then that would make you feel better, right? Um, they seek some living person who they can unload their feelings, either in fact or in effigy. Why? Because unloading our feelings is one way in which we seek relief when we're suffering. He says it's an anesthetic. It's our narcotic against torment. And he says this is the true physiological cause of resentment, revenge, things related to them, the longing for some anesthetic against pain through one's emotion. And he talks a little bit more about this. Um, you know, people blame think people blame other people and things not only for the things that happen to them immediately but also for where they are in society, don't they? I'm in this, this crappy position, this dead-end job, this uh, you know, unfortunate one-down place because somebody screwed me. It's their fault. If I could just hurt them or take something away from them, then things would be okay with me. That's, that's resentment. That's what Nietzsche thinks is going on 
with this valuation of getting away from good and bad to good and evil. He thinks that's what's going on with the ordinary person. He thinks that's also what's going on with democracy, with socialism, with you know everybody gets a gold star, making everything equal. Um, he thinks that that's eroding our, our sense of values. It's replacing them with a false, reactive sense of values that won't actually make us happy. Um, something else goes on with this as well, and this has to do with like the freedom of the, the will. Um, this is in the first essay. He says, to demand from strength that does not express itself as strength. So we're talking about the, the tough, you know, powerful, powerful people. That does not consist of a will to overpower, a will to throw down, a will to rule, a thirst for enemies, opposition, and triumph is just as unreasonable to demand from weakness that it express itself as strength. So Nietzsche has got this idea that, you know, you look at people, and there are some people that, just by the way they are, they kind of like seek out conflict, don't they? Do you know any people like that? Are any of you people like that? Maybe. I know I was. Still am a little bit. Um, a lot happier now that I'm not so much. But um, Then there's other people who just kind of like avoid conflict, right? We call them conflict averse, risk averse. And can you do an awful lot with changing somebody if they're one way or the other? If you tell them, hey, buck up. Get yourself in there. Think about uh, when it comes to uh, romantic matters and dating and stuff like that. Um, how many of you have had a, a shy friend who liked somebody and they just couldn't go and talk to them? And you know, like you had, you were trying to get your shy friend to go and actually talk to this guy or talk to this girl and, and maybe ask them out or something like that. Um, how did that work? It worked well. You push them. You know, come on, get over there. Take a chance. Some people just don't like to take chances, right? Uh, other people have, have no problem whatsoever. They have this, this confidence that doesn't seem to be based in anything. You know, I was always kind of like in the middle, more probably more on the shy end at first. I had some friends, and man, these guys were ugly, stupid. Um, you know, really didn't have a lot going for them, but they could like just go up and talk to girls. You know. And why? Because because they did. They just went and did it, right? And it works that way with with jobs, and it works that way with with a lot of other things too. There are some people who just go and do it, right? They, like he says, um, it's strength that expresses itself as strength. Same thing with weakness. You you can't really expect from somebody who's weak that they're not going to be weak, can you? So he says a quantum of force is just a quantum of force. Will drive action. It's nothing but this very driving willing itself. So the powerful people just are powerful. That's how you know they're powerful. They show themselves that way. The weak people, they're just weak. They just show themselves that way. It's sort of like putting sports teams out on um, the playing field, right? You want to know who the winner actually is? Play the game. And people can say afterwards, well, you know, if they would have done this a little bit differently and done this a little bit, little bit differently. But they didn't, right? The game played out the way it did, and you know, like, like for instance, you know, like, this is a somewhat disappointing season again for, for me as a Packers fan because I watched our defense, which is better than last year, just like shrivel and, and, and you know disappear against some people's offenses, right? And I could have said, well, you know, we're really good. We just made a few mistakes here and there. No, you can see it on the TV. You know, suddenly these people could like punch through our our lines and, and score touchdowns. We were weak. Actually, no, we, they, they were. I mean, silly even for me to identify with the team, isn't it, from a Nietzschean perspective? I'm way weaker than they, they are. I couldn't stop some, you know, running back plowing into me, let alone some, you know, offensive lineman. Um, but I, so I'm imagining myself. That's because I'm really a weak person, according to Nietzsche. I'm not out there playing football. But even the ones out there playing football, some triumphed, some didn't. You only know who's strong and who's weak by actually looking at who comes out on top. So he says, what people do over here is they look at the strong and they say, the strong could have done otherwise. 
He says, popular morality separates strength from the manifestations of strength, as if behind the strong person were an in, uh, indifferent substrate, you know, some sort of like indifferent neutral, somebody brought up the word neutral before, some sort of neutral position, uh, which is free to express strength or not. But there is no such thing, Nietzsche says. There is no being behind the doing, acting, and becoming. The doer is merely made up and added into the action. So now if you have this point of view and you say, you know, the strong people, they don't actually have to push their agendas and their power and their wills onto other people. That's a choice on their part. They could do otherwise. Then you can start to criticize them, can't you? You can start to call them evil. As he says, it's no wonder that the repressed, secretly smoldering feelings of rage and hate use this belief for themselves and basically even maintain a faith in nothing more fervently than the idea that the strong are free to be weak. So that's what would make the strong evil from this point of view. The strong are free to be weak. And, you know, I put this word mean down here. Let's put another word up here by weak. Nice. Why can't they just be nice? That's the refrain of, of the, the common, the, the herd, the weak. Why can't they just be a nice person? Why do they have to be so mean all the time? I mean, I, I know that, you know, if we're going to run a, a business, somebody's got to, like, you know, have rules and crack the whip every once in a while, but can't they crack it a little bit, you know, less loudly? Not, on, not near anybody? Yeah, well, that doesn't make any sense, does it? Couldn't they maybe just have a recording of cracking the whip and not, not actually crack a whip? That kind of puts people off when you, when you bring that out. That's the way that, that the, the nice, the weak, would look at the, the strong. They could do otherwise. And if they can do otherwise, then they're responsible for being so mean, for, for hurting other people. Um, and then he says, you know, now if that's the case, then the nice and the, the weak can actually look at themselves and say, I don't choose to hurt people. I could, just as much as the strong people, I could be mean like them, but I choose not to be. So I'm good. They could be good if they wanted to. They just have to quit being so tough. Quit trying to control things. Quit trying to make people do things their way. Um, quit trying to be different and higher than other people. So Nietzsche says, um, I'm actually going to skip through this fairly quickly, the, the weak actually appropriate virtues to themselves. They see themselves as the only people who are honest, good, you know, just, caring, all the, these sorts of things. They, they attribute these values to themselves. But really they're just reacting and trying to be different than, than these other people. And they use these as kind of like a scapegoat for why things aren't, aren't good. If it was just, you know, if these people would just knock it off, quit being so mean, quit being, you know, warlike, quit, you know, taking more than their fair share, it would like be heaven on earth. And everybody would get along. So Nietzsche says you've got to choose between one or the other of these. And in the society that we live in, um, there's kind of a mix, he thinks. So uh, I'm actually going to skip a, a little bit ahead and, and talk about what happens at the end of each of the three chapters. And then we'll come back to this, this idea of, of uh, uh, where we currently are. So he says these two opposing values, this is the end, end, end of section one, have been fighting a battle on earth for thousands of years. What are the two opposing values? Good and bad versus uh, good and evil. They've been fighting a battle on earth for thousands of years, and the second value good versus evil, has had the upper hand for a very long time. Um, and he says that the, the battle has been drawn to greater heights and greater depths and has become more and more spiritual, so that nowadays there is no decisive mark, no, no more decisive mark of a higher nature, somebody who's actually, you know, got real potential, a more spiritual nature than that it's split in a sense. So if you actually waver between the two of these, you might, in fact, be this person. But in the culture that we currently live in, where this is what's getting pushed all the time, then 
you're going to you're going to internalize some of this, and there's going to be a struggle inside of you. Which valuation should I go with? And in order for you, from Nietzsche's perspective, you know the might makes right thing. In order for you to do the right thing, you want to actually strip this away. So you know, think back to your your uh, elementary school, high school, middle school. Um, how many of you at one time or another got, got kind of upset with the fact that it seemed like there were some areas where everybody got a gold star? Everybody was, was, you know, everybody won, everybody got a medal. None of you came from an environment like that? My kid can't even play dodgeball. Doesn't even know what dodgeball is. Because dodgeball involves, you know, throwing balls at people. And that might hurt people. And um, hurting people is mean, right? I don't want anyone to get hurt on the playground. That's this sort of viewpoint. None of you came from an environment like that. You all came from an environment like this. Succeed or perish. Yeah. I feel like it's changed. Like I feel like our generation was that. More like this. Yeah, really. Like uh, Interesting. My sister is like six years younger, so but I can see it starting to be like more on the other side where we're getting stuff. Yeah. I, mean, I saw it back in my time, um, the, the shift that was taking place. I think it really depends on where you go to school. There are some schools. There's actually a great, great book um, that came out about 10 years ago. It's called Hard America, Soft America. And it made this contrast between areas where, look, if you don't perform, uh, that's it. you know, And then areas where everybody gets a gold star, that was Hard America and Soft America. And I said, you know, a lot of schools are turning into Soft America. Which is not too good because then once you get in the workplace, what's the workplace like? Hard America, yeah. Um, unless you, you know, say go into government work or something like that. Um, get into a union sometimes. Um, so, if you, let's say you did get into, you, you were in that sort of situation and you didn't like the kind of everybody gets a gold star, you might still also be able to see some point to it. Didn't you, don't you feel bad sometimes for the, the people who, who don't win, who suffer? You don't feel bad for them at all? Sometimes, everybody, I think everybody feels a little bad for them. The question is, what do you do with that, what Nietzsche calls pity? Do you allow that to sort of skew you over into this point of view? It's our job to really just take care of the, the nice people, the weak people, the ones who uh, don't come out on top. Um, Nietzsche says that this struggle, I look for the curious, this struggle actually runs throughout every society, every institution, every um, family. Let's see if I can find this passage. Every um, Every sort of situation that you could possibly imagine. Um, yeah, here we go. The desire of sick people to present some form or other of superiority for the nice, for the weak, for the sick to be in charge. Their instinct for secret paths leading to a tyranny over the healthy, over the healthy, the, the noble. Where can we not find it? This very will to power of the weakest people. Take a look into the background of every family, every corporation, every community. Everywhere you see the struggle of the sick against the healthy. A quiet struggle, for the most part, with a little poison powder, with needling, with deceitful expressions of long suffering. But now and then again, with that sick man's pharisaic tactic of loud gestures, whose favorite role is noble indignation, getting upset with other people for being too mean, for being too competitive, for imposing their values, and you know, for not getting along with other people. Um, he's saying this, this runs through all of us. This runs through every institution. So we all either need to decide, you know, are we going this way or are we going this way? And, and for Nietzsche, if you're going to go this way, he says, great, you fit in with me. And if you're going this way, he says, got nothing more to say to you. You're, you're, you showed yourself as being one of the weak. Um, the other thing that he says about this is, is kind of interesting. This is mostly in section three. He talks about our culture itself as being sick, being pervaded with sickness. And that this is you know, a manifestation of that. And 
whose job is it to take care of the sick? Um, this, this brings up an interesting sort of paradox. Imagine that, that a plague broke out here in, in the United States, or even just here in Poughkeepsie. Let's say they walled in our city, right? They don't want it, don't want it to get out. Who should take care of the sick people? What do you think? I'm going to say doctors, but sure. But in terms of like sick or healthy people, who should be taking care of the sick people? Should the healthy take care of the sick? Yeah. Sick people. Why? Because it's plague and you're sick. Why do you want someone else to get sick? Yeah. It, well, you might want somebody else to get sick because then they, you know, misery, misery loves company, right? Um, but if you're if you're healthy, you should stay the hell away from sick people. Um, this isn't a common cold, you know, that you're going to get over. This is a sickness that goes to the depth of one's very soul, according so if you're actually healthy, you should actually resist everybody's pressure on you that's being brought for you to be sick like them and for you to use the strength that you have to serve the sick. Let the sick take care of the sick. And if they can't take care of themselves, that's, that's too bad for them. Then they don't really deserve to live, according to Nietzsche. They don't deserve anything. The only people who actually deserve anything for Nietzsche are the ones who can actually take it, who actually create values, who bring uh, contributions, <coughs> who stand out. So, you know, what do we see here, you know, to sort of recap? This is that Mike makes right philosophy, isn't it? This is a much starker, much more radical version of it than Thrasymachus's. This one actually can make sense out of why most people don't see it this way. Um, I don't myself endorse this, by the way. I, I've been presenting this as if you know I was a Nietzschean, but just so you can sort of get get your head around it and see what merit, what what virtue it might have. If you're attracted to this sort of thing in our society, you're probably not going to be a warrior out on the front lines. Although, have you guys seen that movie, A Few Good Men? Uh, Jack Nicholson's character, he's one of these. Um, Tom Cruise's character is one of these in that movie. That, that famous speech, you can't handle the truth. Um, you want the truth, you can't handle the truth. The truth is that you need some people out on the front lines to actually do the tough things. That would be this sort of mentality. Where else would we find this in our society, though? That's pretty rare. You know, We don't have too many people actually on, on the front lines. Where else would we find this, this sort of view? Where it's not really just about protecting the weak, remember? It's about sort of imposing structure, imposing order, imposing values. Who else would be doing this? Yeah. The government. Well, except that the government is really serving the weak for the most part. Um, you know, think about it. Most of our the, the the highest expenditures that we have right now are what we call entitlements. What are entitlements about? Paying people, you know, for things that will keep them from hurting, Medicare, keep them from suffering. Nietzsche would probably say, screw Social Security and Medicare. You know, let, let, let these people, you know, fend for themselves. Um, so the government that we currently have wouldn't, wouldn't be like that. Both parties, by the way, Nietzsche would not actually be for the Republicans or the Democrats. Um, who would he be for? Who would he look at? Yeah. Dictator. What's that? Dictator. Yeah, if you could, if you could actually become a dictator, that'd be great. If there, if you, the trouble with dictators is there only be one of them, right? Uh, if you if you have a dictator. Um, now, you notice, though, a lot of dictators get into power by, by sort of coddling the weak. You know, Hugo Chavez is a good example. Um, exercises tyrannical power. Does so on the benefit to the, to the you know, backing of, of the, uh, the weaker forces in his society. Um, what about in business? Business can be kind of cutthroat, right? 
you know how many types you might fit this? We'd say, hey, you either succeed or you, or you fail. And if you fail, I don't have anything to do with you. I'm, I'm here to mix with winners. Like if you took, you know, the Forbes, uh, or you take Barron's or any sort of business magazine, and let's say you cut out all the philanthropy parts, you know, where people are actually benefiting other people, and you just have like the, the robber Barron's. That'd be a good example. Or in, in entertainment, who would be the people who would really matter the most? The artists who get to call their own shots, right? Our actors who become directors. Being an actor is one thing. Being a director, now that's power. Being a producer, that's even more power. You can do whatever you want then. Um, can you think of any other areas? Or, you know, like he says, this, this applies in every family, this applies in every corporation. Um, would there be any people, say, in a family or a relationship? If you, if you were a Nietzschean, you should probably dominate the other person or people. Make them do things your way. If they don't like it, let them rise up. And then they actually can be respected. If they can't, then they're weak. And, and you don't want to actually like listen to them over here saying, you know, you should all get along, you should be nice. I think you can imagine a lot of cases in which this, this would apply. Um, the funny thing, and I'll close with this, the funny thing is, in my life, I've met quite a few people in Parker's Epics and Philosophical Circles who have called themselves Nietzscheans, and a lot of them don't strike me as actually living up to this. You know, they, they seem to be more filled with, with resentment and rancor than you know, Nietzsche's character over here, who's supposed to be you know, very free, very open, liberated, all that sort of stuff. I think these days, probably, if you were really a Nietzschean, you wouldn't brag about it. You wouldn't tell people, hey, I'm a Nietzschean, you know, and carry around a book of Nietzsche all the time to show everybody just, you know, what a complete, you know, cutthroat, mean person you are, when all you're really doing is carrying around a book. You're not actually doing anything. For Nietzsche, you, the only way you would fit this type would be to actually be doing something. And I, I don't think too many people who, who, you know, meet this type these days are spending too much time reading Nietzsche. As a matter of fact, to, to do things just Nietzsche's way, wouldn't that be for somebody else to have kind of control over you? So there's a little bit, little, little bit of a paradox there. So that's where we'll leave it off.